Greetings, everyone. My name is Peter Young, and I'm a member of the uh, Committee 100, and I also chair of this uh, Committee 100 Asian American Career Ceilings uh, Initiative. I'm also the CEO of Young Partners, a uh, international investment bank. Uh, I'm very pleased to uh, to welcome you to this session. This is somewhat of an unusual session because this is sort of like uh, a repeat uh, of a series, like in Netflix in that uh, we originally had uh, a, the program with the two gentlemen here uh, on April 27th, uh, but because we had so many questions and so many people uh, attending, uh, we realized that we had run out of time to go through the questions. Actually, there were 102 chats, which not all were questions, uh, but, uh, but a large number were. So our objective today is uh, we will start with a brief summary of some of the key points that were made uh, on April 27th, but we'll try to endeavor essentially to do two things. One is to answer uh, many of the questions that were posed by many of you uh, in, on April 27th, and we'll do that for about th 30 minutes. Uh, and uh, many of you, by the way, are, are uh, attended last time, so Hopefully, if you've submitted questions, yours will be answered. But we still want to leave some time at the end uh, for new questions from the audience. So we'll roughly have five minute introduction, about a 30 minute uh, rendition of the, of the of answers to the April 27 questions. And then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, I do want to comment about uh, the program and future events. But before I do, I want to just remind you that the uh, best way for you to ask questions is to use the chat function. And I think everyone is familiar with that. And basically, if you can click on it, type in your question, uh, that would be the best way for the panelists to be able to see uh, the questions. Uh, last, I just want to say that this series has been a very exciting series. And when we first started it in February of 2020, uh, we didn't expect to have as many people interested attending or as many topics that people would find valuable. But this is, I believe, the 14th one since February of 2020. And uh, uh, I think we'll continue to do these as long as we have speakers and topics that people find interesting. Uh, just for your information, 503 uh, people registered for this event, and obviously not all will attend. But that's probably a good measure of how, uh, the, what the interest level is, is in this topic. Uh, lastly, I wanna say that we have at least two events coming up on June 22nd, I believe. We will have one on Woman Incorporation and we'll have uh, Jenny Ming, who is quite famous, who, uh, who started and ran uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, some major retail uh, stores and also Deb uh, Liu, who uh, was a very senior person at Facebook and is now head of ancestry.com. Uh, so we have two very uh, successful uh, uh, women who uh, are also Committee 100 members, but uh, uh, they'll talk about the experiences they went through, but also, uh, what they perceive in their industry sectors, and they're quite different. One is high tech, and one is uh, real re uh, retail, which is, uh, by the way, Jenny Ming with regard to Old Navy, which I think all of us uh, recognize that. And then last, on uh, July 17th, we're going to have somewhat of a different uh, format in that we're going to have a sort of a discussion, dialogue, town hall on the overall topic of what more can we do? What more can we do in terms of things that are already in place that people are working on, uh, but also what new things, initiatives uh, can we take? And it's going to be unique because all of you who attend are essentially going to be the ones involved. Because after a short panel at the start with a couple of people who are heads of a couple of these organizations, uh, we'll move on to divide you all into tables uh, in discussion groups to really discuss the topic. And at the end, uh, some a discussion leader from each table 
will get up and summarize the three or four really the best ideas that came up in their table. So this is a very exciting kind of format and uh, we hope all of you uh, have the opportunity to participate. With that, uh, we have again, two prominent uh, researchers uh, on this topic. Uh, Michael Morris, who is a professor at Columbia Business School and Jackson Liu, who is at the MIT Sloan School. And the two of them have done a an immense amount of work, nine different research uh, studies, really to focus on this issue of what drives uh, the whole uh, career ceiling for Asian Americans. And uh, we'll start out by uh, allowing uh, uh, Michael to summarize some of the key points that were covered in April 27th, and then they'll move immediately into answering many of the questions from uh, from April 27th, and then uh, to uh, uh, to answer your new questions today. Well, Michael, go ahead. Thank you, Peter. And thank all of you for uh, the, your interest. It's a real privilege for Jackson, Alu, and myself to share our research because you are the real experts on the topic, the people who've, who've lived it. Um, we started with the question of, aren't Asians doing just fine? Aren't they the model minority? And the answer is yes, they are, but not necessarily in leadership. There's a gap in leadership. There's a so-called career ceiling. It's certainly not absolute. And a lot of you you all are exceptions to the rule. You are all extremely successful people, but some of your, your peers have faced this uh, career ceiling. Um, so that's not news to you, but as social scientists, Jackson and I thought we could contribute by trying to empirically measure the phenomenon and, and look at its scope and look at its causal mechanism. That's sort of the two, two questions that a social scientist takes when you wanna understand the phenomenon. So if we're thinking about the scope of it, we asked ourselves, you know, is it an Asian phenomenon that, that affects everyone from Asia uh, as, as the label, you know, bamboo ceiling might suggest, um, or is it is it more specific? So we we focused on two broad groups, uh, South Asians and East Asians, uh, defining South Asians as, you know, the subcontinent, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh, and uh, East Asia's, uh, you know, China, Japan, Korea. And um, we compared um, in various kinds of studies, samples of East Asians and South Asians and, and then non-Asians. And what we observed repeatedly with different kinds of methods is that the uh, career ceiling, the, the sort of gap in representation in the executive ranks uh, seems to affect East Asians uh, more than South Asians. What's really startling and new in our results is, is the finding that South Asians seem to be doing even better than whites on average in some of these leadership things, which if you look at the CEOs on Wall Street and the CEOs in the tech industry, maybe isn't that much of a surprise. It's something that's been hiding in plain sight. Uh, and then the question is why? So looking at mechanisms of this problem, what we do is we try to measure lots of variables about people and see how they're correlated with those particular person's experience of career ceilings. And some of the uh, horses in the race that we investigated was this idea that perhaps, um, perhaps East Asians or Asians uh, are more interested in a technical prowess and not so interested in holding an executive role or, or not, you know, or not as uh, high in their aspirations. Um, so we, we kind of those, you know, you may think that's not even worth investigating, but you know, some people have expressed those ideas. So we, we took various measures of people's um, aspirations, work motivation, you know, uh, leadership goals. And we repeatedly found no difference across the groups in that, or sometimes Asians look even higher than whites. Uh, Asians certainly care more about success uh, than whites do on, in surveys. Um, so then the other thing that we looked at was measures of verbal assertiveness. And it's a very kind of specific concept. Verbal assertiveness means that you, you kind of have a taste for engaging in debate, uh, that you're comfortable uh, expressing a, a view in public. Um, that you can, um, you know, 
push an idea and, and have sort of constructive conflict around the idea. So it's a, it's a thing that we measure uh, sometimes via self-report by asking questions of that sort. Sometimes we measure it by asking peers how verbally assertive are these employees or these managers. And we consistently find that verbal assertiveness is the causal mechanism identified by the correlations in our research. And of course the research has limitations and we have lots of excellent questions from you about that. Uh, we also looked in some ways at the variable of prejudice and we found the somewhat surprising finding that the level of prejudice against South Asians is higher than East Asians, at least when we did the research pre-COVID. We know these things are in flux. Um, so as best we can tell, um, it's primarily an East Asian issue and it's primarily running through uh, levels of verbal assertiveness you know, in the workplace. And that's where we left off last week. And then we got lots of really great questions about the research and about future directions. And we'd like to, um, we'd like to take those on now. No, and I, I believe that uh, Michael, you and, and Jackson have sorted through all those questions and picked out the ones to go through. So I'll let you uh, sort of work your way through the questions that you thought made sense to, you know, to try okay. to address. Well, why don't we do this, uh, Jackson? I'll read the question, and then you take the first stab at answering it. I do the easy work. You do the you do the more. Um, you're the lead author, right? So you get the hard job. So I put these questions in categories. We, you know, there were about thirty uh, actual questions. You know, in addition to many long, interesting comments. So the questions we sorted into categories, and the first set of questions are questions about nuances in the results about uh, details of the results that we didn't really talk about much last time. So the first question from Sue Ann Hong is, was there a breakdown by gender in your studies? Were there any effects that differed uh, by gender? Jackson? Yes, I would say that's a great question. And that's clearly a question that we cared a lot about. So we actually explored in each of our nine studies. And what we saw was that the results are actually a bit mixed, right? So in some studies, we see that East Asian women and East Asian men, uh, they, they, they do sort of equally bad uh, in terms of leadership representation. Uh, but in some other study, we see that East Asian women actually are particularly underrepresented in leadership attainment, uh, which perhaps is not surprising given that we know from previous research, a lot of research were suggesting that women face the, this glass ceiling. So in a sense, East Asian women uh, would sometimes face a uh, basically a double bind, right? So being both, both East Asian and uh, women. So, but as I said, the results are mixed. So we're interested in exploring further. Yeah, I would also note that um, assertiveness also tends to be a variable that comes up in research on gender. So right. it may be that there's two contributors to lower assertiveness, one being female, one being East Asian. Um, in, and it's also worth noting that in some of the research on uh, leadership attainment or career ceilings among ethnic minorities in the United States, women do better than men. So some of the studies on African-Americans find that African-American women have succeeded uh, at higher rates than African-American men. Um, I, think, I think most of the studies on East Asians find things pretty close to us, what we found, which is that East Asian women are, are doing about as well as East Asian men. Um, yeah. uh, okay, uh, the next one about nuances in the results, this is from Harrison Lung. Uh, he says, how much of the South Asian East Asian difference is driven by objective facts, you know, the job title that somebody holds, as opposed to mindset or self-perception, uh, you know, feeling that you are a leader. Um, Jackson? Yes, another great question, right? So about this idea of driven by facts or mindsets. Uh, what we see is, so first of all, I think we acknowledge that mindset can definitely play a role. The way they report, for example, when they answer the question, are you in a senior role and so on. But as Michael mentioned, we did 
uh, a series of ni nice studies. And in some studies, the measurement of leadership attainment is actually objective, right? So for example, our first study where we, we looked at the archival data of S&P 500 CEOs, and we just literally counted uh, who is the CEO and so on, right? So there we have objective data at the highest level of US corporate leadership. We consistently see that East Asians are underrepresented and actually South Asians uh, are overrepresented, or as I should say, better represented than whites once we accounted for their, uh, you know, CO to population ratio. And also in our MBA study, where, for example, we looked at uh, MBA students who started the program without any you know, leaders, any assigned leaders, right? We looked at uh, leadership election and see which MBA students actually got elected to become the cluster chair, the social chair, and so on. And again, we saw a clear difference where South Asians did quite well and East Asians were underrepresented. It is a, it is a finding uh, well known in the literature on um, uh, like 360 performance data where each manager rates themselves and is also rated by their peers that in right. the West, you tend to see a, a self-enhancing bias where I, I think I'm a little better than my peers think I am. And in East Asia, you see a modesty bias where managers will rate themselves a little bit lower than their peers rate them. So that subjective thing is a very real phenomenon, but it's not the, it's not the, the, the whole enchilada that we are seeing in our, in our research because we see it. Absolutely. And I should add uh, that, so what I talked about was leadership attainment, right? For uh, a certain, it's also, as Michael mentioned, we had 360 ratings. We had, uh, you know, people self-report and we see that East Asians are more likely to report being lower on certain is, but we also had other reports, right? Other ratings. And again, uh, we see that East Asians were rated as significantly less assertive uh, than for example, South Asians. All right, another question about nuances in the results. This is from Drayton Thomas and Drayton asks, within the many other factors that you controlled for, such as English fluency, immigration status, like first generation, second generation, third generation. Um, did any of these factors stand out as additionally important drivers of leadership attainment? Yes. So first of all, I want to thank Drayton, the person clearly listened carefully to our uh, talk last time, uh, where we said, indeed, we controlled for English fluency and immigration status, you know, whether you're first generation, whether you're international and so on. We consistently found, for example, East Asians, you know, even for East Asians born in the United States, they're still less likely to attain leadership than South Asians born in the United States, right? Suggesting that English fluency or immigration status, uh, they don't just count for uh, the so-called bamboo seeding, the gap between East Asians and South Asians. And to answer the question more directly, indeed, we did, we did see that English fluency and also being born in the United States both positively predicted leadership attainment. Uh, and that's above and beyond the uh, differences, for example, the ethnic differences, which is to say all these factors matter as you would expect. Mm. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, a lot of the people who try to think of alternative explanations for our phenomenon, they naturally go to the fact that, you know, India has some similarities to the United States that say China doesn't have, one being that English is a widespread uh, language and has been for generations. And then some of you uh, asked about other things, but we'll, we'll get to those other things. Um, yeah. the, the next category of questions. Michael, yeah. perhaps before we move on, we could address some of similar questions in the chat because I noticed there are some oh, yes. okay. similar methodological questions in the chat about how we did the study. And perhaps a good idea, you know, afterwards or in between, uh, maybe Peter or Mike, we can, we can post the link to the paper, because I think the paper clearly details, you know, we have a 70 page supplemental materials and also the actual paper that would answer uh, some of the questions, just in case you still have other questions. So for example, Cynthia asked, have you included educational uh, attainment of the two groups? Uh, absolutely, in each of our studies where possible, we controlled for their age, education. I think someone else here asked about demographic factors such as age, uh, gender, and so on. So. Uh, where possible in each of our studies, we controlled for these factors. And again, we see 
the uh, leadership discrepancy above and beyond, off, even after we control for D, right? So for example, for education, in, uh, in some of our field studies with organizations, we controlled, statistically controlled for people's individual educational attainment, the highest level of education. And then in our MBA studies, obviously everyone uh, was attending the same business school, so the same education level. By the way, there was one question asked, which was, uh, is there any access to the video of the last uh, broadcast, uh, the last uh, webcast? And the answer to that is yes. And uh, we distribute that link to the people who, would, who registered last time, but we'll be happy to distribute it to everyone who registered this time. So you can watch, uh, like Netflix, right? The series, you can watch uh, the April 27th and then roll over to the June 8th one, right? Yes. And also I just posted the link to our paper published in the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences in the chat in case people have further questions about the methodological details. Good. Um, now, the majority of the questions were about other topics that could be studied, you know, other things that could be investigated. And I want to come to that last because I think that that sort of is the most open ended topic. But the, the next category that sort of follows from uh, the, the, the studies that we did is what interventions are specifically suggested by our findings, which suggest that assertiveness is a key conduit, you know, for this, uh, for this leadership difference to uh, come into effect. So there's a question from, and, and I'm, I apologize if, I, if I'm mispronouncing anybody's name, but uh, Gang Zhu um, says, says, maybe there's a problem in, the, the West's or the United States definition of leadership, uh, its, its style and its attributes. Um, and so the intervention shouldn't be um, changing the behavior or habits of East Asian managers. It should be changing uh, the, the organizations that are not promoting them. Um, Jackson, what do you have to say about that? Yes, I think what Michael and I would say, our view is that this is always a two-sided problem, right? So we should not blame the victim. We should not blame the East Asians. Uh, you know, we think it's a two-sided problem. So from the organization side, uh, we think the onus breaking the bamboo ceiling shouldn't fall on East Asians themselves, right? Maybe we should start with the organization, even though things might not change overnight. Uh, so we think American organizations should evolve the implicit approach type of leadership to maybe fit an increasingly diversifying workforce. And just to recognize that being a surf leader, being a surf, you know, is, is not the only successful leadership style, right? So perhaps organizations, American organizations can benefit from East Asian sort of group focused, protection oriented leadership style. Um, you know, listening is certainly important while even though, you know, we know assertions of sharing your opinions, voicing your opinions is also important. And I think by appreciating diverse leadership styles, American organizations can better leverage East Asian leader talent, uh, especially uh, as Michael mentioned, our research shows that East Asians are equally interested in leadership roles, they're equally motivated by leadership positions. Anything you would like to add, Phil? Yeah, we think that there may well be a, a sort of time lag uh, between the efficacy of leadership styles and the, um, the expectation of those leadership styles uh, in organizations. So as, as someone who's not Asian and who's fairly assertive, I am constantly being uh, told these days that you know, my leadership should be less assertive because of the younger Gen Z and millennials who don't uh, like to have who like to feel safe etc uh, rather than having you know like really vigorous debates um, in in meetings etc so I when I see sort of the leadership style that's called for to address the younger generation it looks a lot like the East Asian leadership style so it, it may be that um, you're right that the organizations need to adjust uh, their notion of what leadership looks like um, based on what's really effective today. 
Okay, uh, the next question from uh, Chen Chen. Uh, how do East Asians grow their assertiveness uh, from, uh, you know, from the time that they're young kids uh, to the time that they're professionals developing themselves? So do we know anything about ways to increase assertiveness? It's a very important question. So, so far we haven't exactly looked at sort of precise interventions to help East Asian grow assertiveness. And, and again, you know, I think organizations here should play an important role rather than just leaving East Asians, um, you know, on themselves to figure out how to grow assertiveness. But we can imagine, for example, organizations can organize uh, communication workshops and East Asians can be encouraged to speak up in meetings in classrooms, you know, starting from young kids, right? They could even, if they recognize that potentially their cultural background uh, might, for example, have, uh, might be detrimental or might uh, impede their leadership progress, they can actively seek opportunities, for example, to uh, join debate club or uh, try stand-up comedy, or even simply tell themselves, well, before I walk into a meeting, tell myself, okay, today at least I will ask one question. Well, at least I will speak up once. I think those things would be a great start. Good, okay. Final question about interventions. Um, this is from Wei Ga. Uh, and this is a challenging question and I think a really good one. Uh, he, the, uh, the question is, uh, the study seems to be suggesting that if only East Asians would speak up more like their South Asian brethren, then all these anti-Asian discrimination issues would be resolved. But really, would addressing this one single factor make the inequality go away? I agree with Michael. It is a great question. Uh, since I was talking all the time, would you like to take or I can I can give it I'm a happy chance, to but... do it. I don't want to put uh, all of the all of it on you. I think that good. it's a it's a great question because intervention science is a whole is a whole game of its own. You know what what Jackson and I, Jackson and I do basic research, so we're we're looking for what is the mediating variable statistically that would seem to be the the, the causal factor, and generally the causal factor is the target of the intervention, but the world is a little more complicated than just a set of mechanisms that add up to each other. Sometimes the mechanisms are interrelated and, and hydraulic so that if you, you know, if you fix this, then this becomes an even bigger problem. And for example, in the, in the literature on gender and, um, and career ceilings, the, the first wave of advice was, well, that women should be more assertive. You know, they should speak up more. They should be more demanding when they're when they're negotiating. And the finding the finding that came out was that, well, a lot of the times when women do act more assertive, they're they're punished for that much more than a man would be for the same behavior. So the same behavior by a woman comes across as short-sighted and pushy, whereas from a man, it comes across as, well, he really has conviction in his, you know, his skills. So um, th this is often referred to as the double bind, like, you know, you, you can be feminine and then you don't get a raise, or you can act less feminine, but then people, you know, think that you shouldn't be allowed to interact with clients because you're strident. Um, and so the question here, you know, putting, drawing the analogy, if, um, East Asian employees who, who weren't formally that assertive started acting assertive all of a sudden one day, would people um, notice it quite a bit and, and push back against it? Um, and then there's a different question, which is if, if a new rising generation of East Asians is more assertive, um, would people notice and would people push back? And I, I think certainly for the first one, when a person changes overnight, they're probably going to have a surprise factor and they're going to have um, people like, whoa, you're certainly speaking up a lot lately. Um, but generally, generationally, I mean, certainly there's a, I mean, in my experience, working with uh, a lot of, um, you know, I've worked with a lot of East Asian graduate students. Uh, Jackson's a lot different from the, the students I worked with 20 years ago. Uh, so I think that, you know, generationally, there may be an increase in assertiveness that um, doesn't carry with it 
backlash because it's it doesn't stand out because it's part of a generational phenomenon. Um, I'll make one one short comment, and that is, um, I don't know if you know, but we actually had a, a webcast which was the millennial perspective. Good. And we had four millennials, uh, different genders, et cetera, different careers as a panelist. But the interesting thing is before that, we did a broad survey of all the people who registered and we made them ask, ask a number of questions. And it was very interesting because some of the things we tried to see is, was there a difference in response by age group? Did millennials or people who were advanced in their careers feel differently to different genders? And it really, you know, a lot of the points really uh, support, Michael, what you're saying, you know, about gender differences and so forth. So uh, um, I'll share some of that with the, with you. It's not a scientific uh, study, but it was an interesting survey of all the people who registered. Interesting to know. Yeah, I mean, it's really impressive how in this speaker series, you've covered so many facets of the, of the issue by hearing close commentary from people who are who are living that you know and, and that that is uh, really insight producing to those of us who do research on it um, all right the next the next sort of category of questions that I think follows are some really interesting questions about advocacy and I know a lot of you are in the role formally or informally as advocates you know as uh, people pushing your organization for more representation of East Asians in leadership or, you know, you working on political campaigns with East Asian candidates or uh, one or another form of advocacy. And so questions were asked about what our findings suggest for advocates. Uh, Sandy Shu says, how can one productively engage in advocating for programs for East Asians to advance in the workforce given the political climate today. For example, I've witnessed certain attempts where the organization will attribute East Asians lack of leadership representation as something they need to pick up themselves with no organizational interest in helping. Um, and in, maybe in some industries, a notion that Asians are overrepresented. Um, so what are effective ways uh, to, to make this case. I think it's, you know, it's a little different than, I mean, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give one answer then Jackson, you can suggest what, what you think about this. I think that if, if I were an advocate for say Hispanic representation in the tech industry, I would focus a lot on the pipeline. You know, like, do we, do we have enough people starting in entry level jobs so that there's a decent chance that some of them will rise to the top. Um, if I were, were advocating on behalf of East Asians, I might not have that same focus because, you know, it is probably the case that East Asians are proportionally overrepresented in a lot of these desirable industries relative to their representation in the population, but their their advancement is underrepresented relative to their. Um, their representation in the initial jobs and in my view, underrepresented relative to their performance. Because I think in a lot of, a lot of the tech companies I know that the most important innovations have come from East Asians, you know, um, and, but East Asians are not in the C-suite. Um, so I think it's a different focus. It's, it's a focus on um, not on, oh, we're trying to, it, it's certainly not, for example, like the kind of thing where we're, we're demanding special quotas, you know, for hiring our group because you're, our group is already being hired because we're talented, right? But we're, what, we're, what, we're, what we're demanding is something very different, which is when leadership decisions are made, they should be made based on documented performance and talent, not based on stereotypes about who's a good leader. Uh, Jackson, do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I think Michael's points are fantastic. I completely agree. In addition, I would add that sometimes the idea is that sort of Asians, you know, they are assumed to be this model minority being just fine because most visibly people sort of interact day to day. They see, oh, there are a lot of, you know, East Asians in cafeterias. I can see a lot of East Asians, right? So thriving. So what are you talking about? Or they see data objectively, oh, look, East Asians, they have high median income, right? So they're not really facing challenges, they're doing just fine. I think 
precisely because Asians are perceived as the model minority doing just fine, right? They sometimes the challenges can be overlooked. So it's important for us, for people in the audience, for us researchers, really um, promote and you know just show show the actual statistics, right? For example, our research actually shows this career ceiling faced by East Asians, and a lot of the senior managers, the CEOs, they may be vaguely aware of this, but they can choose not to listen. But if you show them real statistics, like look, you know, we have East Asians are quite well represented at the entry level, but mm. you don't see them in our company, you know, we don't see them here. And then I think the conversation can really start, right? And also uh, because we see that as Michael mentioned, our research shows that sometimes in some settings, South Asians are actually better represented than white. And then demographically, if organization HRs lump all groups together, then sometimes this, this uh, career ceiling faced by East Asians might actually be hidden. Right, so it's actually only when you break down those two groups, then you see these striking gaps. And so it's very important for organizations to recognize that, look, Asians are not just a single monolithic group. We need to recognize some of the cultural differences and the different Asian subgroups might face unique challenges. So I think that's sort of a really important starting point. I mean, that's great. Make your arguments based on data because the data exactly. is your friend. The data, you know, makes the case very eloquently on its own without any social justice uh, rationales needed, um, you know, just in terms of organizational efficiency. Okay, next question about advocacy and the challenges involved. And again, this is a great question and it's one that we deal with every day, which is um, from Catherine Sun. It seems easy to take these findings and say, aha, cultural stereotypes are true. Uh, Chinese people are meek and Indians are argumentative. Um, how does one navigate and interpret these findings without devolving into these gross simplifications? It's a great question. I feel nervous every time I talk to a public group about these findings because there's a tendency to speak in shorthand and to say um, East Asians are X, South Asians are Y, instead of saying, there is a statistical tendency for East Asians to experience this and a tendency for South Asians to experience that. So um, it's only a stereotype when you're assuming that it's uniform and that it's rigid and that there's something pejorative about it. And, you know, if, if but to say that there's a group difference, that's, that's not a stereotype. The stereotype comes when you put it on an individual in a way that's limiting to them. Uh, so uh, I guess uh, it's not easy, though, because we speak in, in shorthand. Right. So do you have a, a way to stop yourself from sounding like you're speaking in stereotypes when you talk about this? Uh, I agree with Michael. It's certainly a tough question, right? So and stereotypes are hard to change. As Michael mentioned, you know, women face the double bind. And I think sometimes East Asians certainly also face the double bind, right? When they don't speak up, they don't get noticed, they don't get promoted to leadership positions. When they're too assertive, when they do speak up, people say, well, you are too assertive for uh, East Asians. And I think in my personal experience, what I found, and I don't know if it's been working for me, uh, I've been, uh, you know, I, I find that humor uh, never hurts, right? Interject a sense of humor here and there could ease some of the tension. Uh, and show that you have good intention. Uh, you're not trying to be abrasive. You're not trying to be aggressive. And so I think humor is always a nice lubricant in conversations and to just assure people that, you know, I, I, you know, I, I'm not aggressive. I don't have bad intention. Uh, I think, yeah, that, that could help. Mm -hmm. so that, that, that goes back to your recommendation about stand-up comedy, right, Jackson? Yes, <laughs> two birds in one stone. Practicing humor and communication. <laughs> a, a person we mentioned last time is Andrew Yang, you know, who's salient to me because I'm in, I'm in New York. I think Peter also, and he's, you know, neck and neck, you know, in the mayoral race. And I think when he was running for president, uh, he did quite well on the debate uh, stage. And uh, there's a group of us at Columbia who, who teach a course on communication and we also do some coaching of politicians and, and one of the fellows here was involved in Yang's campaign in a, in a public role. Um, but Yang also 
also is a really funny guy and he uh, he engaged in some spontaneous humor and I think you know I think in the Asian community there was a mixed response to that because if you if you just see some of the jokes he made uh, you know out of context it may seem like he's you know playing off of stereotypes but I think he was trying to I think he was expressing that like he's a he's a flexible guy and that he's not limited in the way that you think he might be and so I think I think it was effective for him but humor is you know humor ethnic humor that makes reference to cultural stereotypes is always a dangerous thing even if it looks good at the time it may be dangerous later on so humor about other subjects uh maybe self-deprecating as opposed to group deprecating Agreed. humor is a better is a better recipe uh okay then the next question the final one of, of about advocacy uh and this one comes from charlene collins and i'm not i'm i, I want to make i'm not 100 percent sure i'm getting it right because i think maybe some words got cut off here but uh the, it's a reference to the current rise of um anti-Chinese sentiment? And could something like this be an impediment to advocacy? Um, and of course, this is a, this is an empirical question. You know, we did our research a year ago. So our two years, the actual data was collected two or three years ago. So we don't, we don't know exactly how uh, the current uh, phenomenon that we see in a very sort of disgusting way with attacks on, you know, attacks on elderly Asians on the streets. Um, is that phenomenon relevant to what managers would experience in the workplace? I'm not certain that it is, you know, I'm not certain that there, there is a global sense of anti-Chinese feeling, uh, but it may just be that in the very margins of society, uh, and especially people who are not mentally 100%, uh, that somehow they're, that, that, that this, this, is, this is a uh, rise in anti-Chinese sentiment among a very small uh, part of the population. Um, any thoughts about this or speculation about this, Jackson? Uh, I would say, if I understood the question correctly, uh, what I would say is, and I'm thinking on the spot, right? If, for example, some of you have a laptop and you can just Google, um, you know, you look at a Google trend. I wonder if, for example, the mention of Asian, or if you look at Google Books and so on, Google Engrams, maybe the, main, the number of Asian, you know, words or phrases that include Asian have been increasing over the past year due to these very unfortunate and unpleasant experiences. And as unfortunate as the situations, these incidents were, I really hope as an East Asian, you know, they can uh, bring about some helpful changes to raise awareness, right? Because as some of you know, I think East Asians or Asians are often perceived as not just the model minority, but also the invisible minority. So hopefully um, some of the attention would be helpful so that people are increasingly actually, you know, trying to understand the challenges Asians face rather than just assuming they're doing completely fine. Uh, so I was chatting with Peter earlier that, for example, I saw just last week, uh, John Oliver, you know, had a new episode just about Asian history. I think NBC had, you know, a couple of videos about uh, anti-Asian issues as well. So hopefully these societal changes would bring about, uh, you know, helpful progress. Now, I guess, uh, Michael, you mentioned that that, that that was the last question from the, from last time, and we'd like to switch over to new questions from the audience. Well, there's, there's, a, there's one more category. There's one more category. Oh, there's one more category. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, go ahead. So the, the, the next category is the more expansive category, which is other factors to study, you know, beyond what we focused on, which was assertiveness. Um, so... And, and a number of these questions are related. So I'm gonna say the first, there's, the first two questions are quite closely related from, from Wei Li. He says, uh, could it be that the caste system in India is relevant? Maybe the early immigrants were from uh, high castes uh, who were connected to the top levels of 
society uh, connected to that. And then uh, Charlene Collins says, the Clinton administration gave out professional visas uh, to South Asians uh, disproportionately. So is it is it a selection phenomenon? Could that be part of what we're seeing that there's just a, a different filter for immigration of South Asians than for immigration of East Asians? Any thoughts? Good question. What I would say, uh, I'll share a couple of thoughts first and then Michael can add. Uh, what I would say is I certainly think these, for example, selective migration uh, can contribute to the career ceiling or the leadership discrepancy faced by East Asians versus South Asians. Uh, but for example, in our studies, right, where possible, we always controlled for socioeconomic status based on, for example, um, the salary or you know, the, the, the parents' educational background or salary and so on. And we still see this leadership discrepancy even after statistic control for those factors. And in addition, just anecdotally, I think a lot of the prominent South Asian CEOs, they actually started uh, as poor immigrants from, from India, right? If you read their biography. And so I think that's, that's quite telling, suggesting that, you know, this is not the socioeconomic status or caste system is probably not the most important factor here. Um, it's still, you know, there, there have been some issues in Silicon Valley, like at Cisco recently, where people have argued that there's still caste discrimination going on in the United States. So it's 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 certainly an issue still, but I don't think it's it's um, pr the primary one of the primary drivers of what we're seeing. Uh, now another another question, uh, which is another very interesting issue from Sandy Zhu, says um, anecdotal evidence seems to point to different levels of in-group favoritism. Some groups have a high proportion of appointing successors who are of the same ethnic group as themselves. Have you considered that? Many East Asians seem to have a very strong sense of fairness and do not participate as much in politics and are not as, as inclined to you know, assure that they have an in-group successor. Um, fascinating question. Um, Jackson, what, what's your view? I would say anecdotally, because the person you know raised the anecdotal question, but I would say anecdotally, I've heard both sides of the story. I've heard people saying sort of East Asians, they, you know, they have their ethnic homophily is too high. They always cluster together, have lunch together, right? Basically meaning too much in-group favoritism. Um, but for example, you know, as Sandy pointed out, there are other cases or contexts where uh, the South Asians seem to be helping each other a lot. So the short answer is I don't have uh, clear data to answer this question, but I think both could be possible. Any thoughts, Michael? One of our, our, our next studies that we are, you know, planning and we are, you know, making all the kinds of arrangements that we have to make to get the data from companies is a data set where we're going to be looking at really multidimensional uh, 360 performance evaluations that were done of executives um, across many industries and across many countries. And in that set of measurements, there are uh, lots of measurements of what would go under the heading of political skills. And so we've, we've just sort of taken peeks at the data and we see some signs that uh, South Asians do seem to have an advantage in this category of like political skills, so networking and you know sort of coalition building, that sort of thing, that they're perceived as good at that, and um, you know, and so that might reflect that East Asians uh, just don't have the same habit of doing it. It might reflect that East Asians have a distaste for it, you know, that they that they have a sense of fairness and they they're not as inclined to do that. Um, it's I think it's an important part of the phenomenon and one that we hope to research. So um, uh, now the next two questions about other factors, um, I'm gonna put them together because I think they're, they're kind of um, the same kinds of issues. Angela Chang asks, uh, do East Asians and South Asians rate differently with regard to charisma? And, uh, and then Sandy Shu says, have you looked at height? You know, given that there's evidence that uh, in among non-Asians that tall, taller people are more likely to get promoted. So 
are, are any of our measurements, do we have any measurements related to height or charisma, Jackson? Uh, in short, we don't. Although if you look at average height, if you just Google it, uh, my impression is that the two sub-Asian groups, they don't differ meaningfully in terms of average height, right? We know, for example, the Dutch are very tall, uh, <laughs> but I don't think, for example, South Asians are particularly or significantly taller than East Asia. I could be wrong, but that's my impression. Um, that again may also be a generational thing. You know, I, I think like uh, diets change and the Dutch didn't used to be tall either, you know, but they, they really, were, uh, they, 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 the, the average in the 20th century, the average Dutch height went from something like five, uh, nine to like six foot two or something, whatever it is now, wow. you know, whereas other groups didn't change. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. And charisma is a, is a funny thing because, um, it's hard to measure charisma um, when, when organizational researchers try to measure charisma, what they find is that um, some of the things that correlate with the perception that say a politician is charismatic is the use of concrete perceptual detail in, in speeches. So people who paint a picture that's very vivid, like say Martin Luther, King Jr. are regarded as very charismatic, um, but it's a, you know, it's it's a very specific phenomenon. It, it doesn't be measurements of charisma don't correlate that highly with getting promoted. Um, so it's, um, you know, I don't think charisma is as important as assertiveness, even though we we kind of have this notion of uh, leaders as uh, needing to be charismatic. Uh, you know, a lot, a lot of CEOs are not particularly charismatic, but they just get the job done. Um, okay, other factors. Howard, Howard Wang uh, says, uh, you know, what about learning styles? And, and I think this is a great point. Uh, there, there are conventions in East Asia of educational systems uh, that emphasize rote learning in part because of the, I think the nature of the language, you know, that you have to memorize a lot of characters. Um, uh, less emphasis on creative thinking and critical thinking, um, but for those raised in the U.S., it may be different. Um, Jackson, do we have any any data points relevant to this? I would say uh, this can certainly play a role, right, in the leadership attainment gap. Uh, although, as I mentioned earlier, in our studies, when we look at even East Asians born and raised within the United States, uh, we still see this leadership attainment gap, right, among the U.S.-born East Asians and U.S.-born South Asians, so suggesting that this is not perhaps the key uh, reason here. And I, I mean, I agree with this person, the, the person who asked the question about sort of, you know, if you focus on learning through memorization and less creative thinking, I think that's in a way related to assertiveness, right? If, you know, you just want to be you don't want to be the nail that gets hammered down, then, you know, because creative thinking is about disrupting convention, it's about breaking norms, right? So I think that goes similar with assertiveness that you don't want to, you know, you want to conform to um, the norm and so on. Uh, so I think that's related. What do you think, Michael? Well, you're, you're kind of the expert on this. Ja Jackson has actually done a number of really interesting studies on creativity. And one of the findings is that Immigrants, you know, people who've lived in many countries tend to be more creative than, than non-immigrants or people who don't have that same experience. Um, so uh, the, the people in our sample who are immigrants have that going for them. And then some of the people have been raised in the United States. So we, we know that a learning styles is not the whole phenomenon, but there certainly is a, a difference in the educational systems. Okay, final question uh, is, um, Pete Su um, asks, how does the rise of the Chinese economy affect the leadership ceiling uh, for East Asians in the United States? And I'll say, um, I'll say in one response to this is that there was an, there was an interesting article in the, in the Economist, say about a decade ago, by some economists that argued that the, um, they, they sort of noticed that, East, uh, that South Asians were doing really well um, in terms of CEO positions, whereas East Asians were not. And they suggested that it had to do with market forces, that there were 
with the boom of the Chinese economy, there were many opportunities for talented leaders and managers in China, whereas uh, this was less so in India. So it might be that the, the, the fact that we see a lot of really successful South Asians here might reflect just that the, you know, they, the, that the opportunities aren't there in their, in their own country. Um, Jackson? You know, I, I would make one point, which is from talking to a lot of, because I, uh, we work with a lot of uh, C-suite companies around the world. One thing worth considering for the two of you is this phenomenon of the Asian division of national, international companies. Okay. And an observation that a number of senior executives have made to me is, there's good news and bad news for, for East Asians. The good news is because of the high growth in China and because of the movement to staff uh, Chinese operations, not with expats who were, didn't have any cultural background, but with Chinese Americans and Chinese, created job opportunities for Chinese Americans. The dark side is how did they ever get back to the headquarters, right? So that right. would be, you know, I think if you do a little bit of analysis, it'd be very interesting to see whether there is this tragic combination of rapid promotion because you become the head of the Chinese branch of, you know, GE something, but then the tragedy of uh, you can't get back to headquarters, right? That would yeah. be interesting to see I'm whether that time. actually yeah. is true. It's like you become pigeonholed as the Asia expert, right? Because you, you know, you, because first of all, you are of Asian heritage and then you did well running that division. And then it doesn't occur to people that you should then become CEO. Yeah, and I know one, I know one CEO who shall remain nameless, who is Chinese, ethnically, who is CEO of a public, large public company. And he said, basically, the, he ran the Asia operations for a while. And he said the challenge was trying to get back to the headquarters and be respected as a headquarters executive. He made it, but he said it, you know, it wasn't easy. Right, right. Um, it's a fascinating, uh, it's a fascinating phenomenon because it's sort of like an opportunity that contains within it a pitfall or a, or a potential trap. You know, in organizations, there's a lot of such things. You know, companies tend to do what they're good at. And then that makes it very hard for them to change when when the environment changes. And, and this is, a, you know, you're naturally pulled into a role. I think, you know, a lot of the um, African-American managers, I know they, they there's a tremendous demand for them to start getting involved in diversity related things. But then they get seen as the, the diversity guy, you know, right. rather than the accounting accounting guy or, or uh, the operations guy. Um, so I think it's um, something to be very wary of. Uh, now, we're, we're approaching the end of the hour. And uh, uh, this has been wonderful because you have interspace between the questions from last time and the questions coming up. You've, you've addressed many of them. Uh, as the host, I'd like the privilege of asking the last question, and that is this. In my family, you know, there are three kids and we all did well. And one of the issues I want to raise is whether there are generational leadership practices or styles among Asian Americans that have a factor. In my family, my parents uh, had a certain style and very similar to their generation of Asian style, and embedded in that was, if you study hard, then you'll succeed. It doesn't matter. You don't want to run for student government or be in sports and so forth. Uh, the three kids, we all basically secretly defied that. And we secretly ran for student body officer. And we, we, we got onto varsity sports because we really didn't believe that their view was correct. That we felt that if we just followed them, maybe we'd get into a good college, but it wouldn't necessarily make allow us to be successful long term. So we had a conspiracy, the three of us, to essentially tie our parents secretly and then just present and say, well, I'm, I happen to be student body treasurer now, so I'm so sorry, right? Uh, so is some of that the case, uh, a, a generational leadership style and, and generational priority that's embedded in kind of East Asian uh, culture and generations, right? 
Yeah, well, I mean, we, in our studies, like, you know, one of our studies is about current CEOs. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of you, your generation or older, right? You know, you're, you're a young CEO. Um, then we have studies of middle managers where we, you know, we were able to partner with an organization and we surveyed all the middle managers that are East Asian or Asian of any kind, um, you know, in the managerial ranks. And so those people are my generation and, and younger. Um, and then uh, we also had a number of studies focusing on current MBA students who are Jackson's generation, right? And we, we see this phenomenon in all those generations. Uh, so I think um, it hasn't, you know, it, it may have evolved, but it hasn't disappeared. <laughs> generation yeah Jackson you want to have the last word <laughs> sure uh, I would say really fascinating practice in your family uh, I'm glad you secretly uh, you know had this coalition I think to maybe the point of some uh, audience comments right so another way to perhaps increase your assertiveness and confidence is to practice these student activities new student governance competitive sports like soccer basketball uh, so I think those could all really uh, help, for example, East Asians or Asians more involved and become more visible in general, right? And one thing we haven't uh, exactly studied, but I think certainly plays a role, is the role of role models, which is to say, if you see, if you increasingly see other East Asians, whether it's Andrew Yang or, you know, other prominent figures, being the head of an organization or society or, you know, some groups, then you might be thinking, huh, I could be like that, right? Was the was this, was this person's story? So you have something to aspire to, to look up to. So, and I hope that day will come soon. Well, I want to I want to end by saying again, a fabulous discussion and answers to questions. Uh, you know, I do think I'm going to call up Netflix and recommend that the, that the two of you have a Netflix show and and people can binge watch. Uh, those of you who are here, we we this is being recorded, so like the one for April 27th, it's going to be available if you want to watch it over and over again. Uh, the other, uh, but I do encourage all of you to attend the, the ones in the future. We have different topics. And I, the good news is Jackson Liu and Michael Morris will be two of the discussion leaders at the July 17th. The only problem is there are only eight seats per table. So you're going to have to, we're going to have to have a waiting list. But uh, they are going to participate uh, in that event. So I want to thank again, a great thanks to the two professors for a fabulous job. And we look forward to your continued future re research. And uh, it's just fascinating uh, what the data shows. Not always, some, some intuitive, some not intuitive, but all informative. So thank you very much. And I want to thank all the audience uh, for attending. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event.